Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to the 17th Field Notes live event. My name is Russell Almaraz. I'm the GIS specialist in uh, Davis, California, and the Field Notes regional representative for the Southwest Soil Survey region. As a regional representative, I serve on the Field Notes Review Committee. The review committee solicits and selects topics for each webinar. Today, we've selected two exciting topics for you, and we encourage you to ask questions at any time using the Q&A panel. The Q&A panel should open by default. However, if for some reason your Q&A panel is not open, simply click on the question mark icon located on the right side of your screen. For closed captions, turn on the live caption uh, button located in the lower right corner. Today's session is being recorded. Recorded sessions are available in Teams on the Field Notes channel and the National Soil Survey Center's YouTube channel. Again, thank you so much uh, uh, for joining us. I hope you enjoy today's session. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Dave Hoover to tell you a little more about today's webinar. Uh, take it away, Dave. Thank you, Russ. Hi, folks. This is Dave Hoover, Director of the National Soil Survey Center. Uh, 17 webinars. That's impressive. I, th I think we have a success on our hands here. We just Concluded uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, some soil and plant science division uh, leadership team meetings. The focus was on communication. This webinar series uh, was brought up as one of the really great ways that we have of increasing employee involvement, communicating the knowledge that we have out there, as well as uh, great outreach uh, to others outside of our uh, small community in NRCS. I've also given two presentations on online resources that are available through the Soil and Plant Science Division. And I always show the uh, YouTube channel that has all of the Field Notes webinars recordings on them. And that always gets a, a positive response from people that here is our, our great topical uh, videos from all over the United States and people will appreciate that they're they're not a a, a two-hour movie version, but usually a, a twenty-minute or so presentation that they can watch, gain knowledge, and then flip to another. So thanks to all folks who have done presentations previously. Thanks to the two people that are going to present today, and let's move on into our uh, number seventeen webinar. Our first presenter today is Matt Cole out of the Minden, Nevada office, and he'll be speaking on data collection in the White Mountains of California and Nevada. Matt, the floor is yours. Okay, good morning, or good afternoon, I guess it's more appropriate for most of you. <laughs> My name is Matt Cole and I'm a soil scientist in the Minden, Nevada Soil Survey Office. And I want to show you all the work that NRCS has been involved with in the White Mountains in California and Nevada and highlight the work that was done there this June. I've been fortunate enough to be involved in this project since I got to work in the White Mountains in 2013. It's been one of the most challenging environments I've ever worked in, but also one of the most stunning. Let's begin by talking about the area. The Whites are a fault block range located on the east central California state line crossing over into Nevada. The nearest town is Bishop, California in Owens Valley to the west. The highest point is White Mountain Summit, which is about 14,252 feet or about 4,244 meters. The elevation is significant, but there are other things that make this range unique. One is precipitation. The Sierra Nevada Mountains, which lie just 60 miles to the west of the Whites, receive approximately 60 inches of annual precipitation. The White Mountains, on the other hand, receive just 15 inches at similar elevations. Here's why. 
As storms follow the jet stream from the Pacific Ocean, they hit the west coast and eventually are forced up in elevation along the western slopes of the Sierra. As the storm's air mass gains altitude, it cools and drops precipitation in the form of rain and snow. This orthographic effect squeezes water out of the air mass. By the time it travels down the eastern slope of the Sierra and up into the same elevations of the Whites, there is a little moisture left. The White Mountains are a very arid landscape because they sit in a rain shadow cast by the Sierra. The other thing that makes the White Mountains distinctive is the presence of the bristlecone pine tree. These agents are adapted to especially harsh climates where few other species can survive. The oldest known bristlecone, called Methuselah, is about 4,853 years old. Its, exa its exact location in the White Mountains is kept secret to keep it safe. Most of the bristlecones are protected within the ancient bristlecone pine forest managed by the Forest Service. The White Mountains have received relatively limited use, especially at the higher elevations. This makes the Whites an ideal place to conduct high altitude research, study arid environments, and monitor indirect human impacts. Areas like the Whites are very sensitive to changes in climate, and so are very useful for monitoring those changes. Shortly after World War II, the Navy eyed the Whites as a place to conduct research and constructed the station there. By 1950, the Navy leased the facility to the University of California to use for public research. High altitude physiology and paleoclimate records contained in bristlecone pine forests were among the first subjects studied. The facility continued to expand and in the 1970s, full ownership of the facility was transferred to the university. By then, the fields of study had blossomed into many disciplines, including geosciences. So now let's fast forward to 2007. Dr. Robert Graham, a soils professor at the University of California, Riverside, shown here on the right, attended a meeting of researchers in the White Mountains discussing projects. One project was a climate transect along the western slopes of the Whites. This sparked Dr. Graham's interest and his desire to collect soils data along the transect. Dr. Graham contacted Dave Smith, shown on the left, the California State Soil Scientist and MO leader. Dave agreed to provide the help of NRCS and was very supportive of the project. This started a collaboration that is still going strong. Dr. Cynthia Stiles, who succeeded Dave Smith, has also been very supportive of NRCS assistance in the Whites. After this collaboration was established, more NRCS personnel became involved, resulting in a fruitful production of research. The expertise of NRCS in plant inventory and collection of soil samples was critical to the success of this work. The laboratory assistance from the Kellogg Soil Survey Laboratory was paramount. I'm going to forego listing the NRCS personnel who have worked on this project in the past because I don't want to risk leaving anybody out, but many are shown here. Dr. Graham now wanted to collect data that could serve as a baseline to measure changes in soil temperature and moisture. This is where I came in. In 2013, Dr. Graham contacted the Minden Soil Survey Office and asked for our assistance to install some hobo loggers that he had purchased. Steve Harriman and myself traveled to the White Mountains to help. Dr. Graham selected sites that had previously been studied to form an elevational transect from about 7,300 to over 14,000 feet. We installed hobo sensors at sites along Dr. Graham's transect, including the high spot on the transect near White Mountain Summit. So here how the sites are laid out. The dashed line is the one road in the area. As you can see, four sites are not adjacent to any roads, and there's really no easy way to access them. The two most remote sites at the top 
require a 6.5 mile round trip over very rugged terrain with an elevational gain of about 4,500 feet. This is hard enough with your personal gear and water. When you are carrying equipment in or soil samples out, it's downright brutal. From the start, we experienced a variety of issues with the equipment. And what it boiled down to is that we were using the hobo loggers in an environment that's way beyond what they're intended for. They're not designed for these extreme conditions. And even when the loggers function correctly, we still have to visit each site yearly to download the data and replace disposable batteries. Another issue is that since these are inexpensive loggers, they have limited flexibility in data collection schemes. In 2017, Dr. Graham retired. His replacement, Dr. Daniel Hermes, shown on the left, was excited to continue to expand the work in the whites. He planned to procure more funding for the data collection. He asked if I could help him upgrade the equipment. So I contacted Kent Sutcliffe, who at the time was with Snow Survey. He gave me a lot of great information and advice and told me about the gear used in scan and snow tail sites. We decided to go with Campbell scientific equipment capable of cell communication with rechargeable batteries and solar panels. By the start of this year, the university had funds ready to upgrade eight of the study sites. This brings us to our work in the whites this year. Once we received the equipment, we had to figure out how to get it installed. Each site required a couple hundred pounds of gear. In addition to the tools for setup and our own personal gear, there's no way we could haul everything to the remote spots. To make this more difficult, every study location falls within the designated White Mountain Wilderness area. Other than the one established road, no motorized vehicles are allowed either in the air or on the ground. But the solution was simple. The mule. The district conservationist in the Bishop Interstate's office, Robert Pierce, put me in contact with the mule team in Bishop. They could haul our specialized gear and were willing to do so over the difficult terrain. Most mule outfits won't even leave established trails, and half of our sites are in undisturbed areas with absolutely no trail access. We were fortunate to find a mule team willing to take on the challenge. Finding the mules was very fortunate, but that was only one of the challenges that we faced. We had all the logistics of travel and setting up a base camp for the crew. Another challenge was becoming familiar with the Campbell scientific equipment and how to program and operate it. But the greatest test was the white mountains themselves. Even with the bulk of the equipment delivered, there was still plenty to carry in over long and unforgiving terrain. We were again fortunate to have an outstanding crew. The eight people included folks from the University of California, Riverside, the University of Oregon, and of course, NRCS. Andrew Brown and myself represented the agency. Andrew is a sole scientist in the Sonora, California office. I'm sure a lot of you already know of him, but I wanna be sure to highlight the work that he did. He came highly recommended, put forth an incredible effort in the field. There was a lot involved in this trip, and as you might expect, not everything went according to plan. But the right people make all the difference. The crew stayed flexible, and we overcame all the unexpected obstacles. We laid down a ton of hard work and were successful in setting up all eight climate stations that we set out to install. This new equipment represents a leap forward in the technology of our data collection. We can check in on any site at any time remotely. We can observe data collection in real time. We can also check the health of the battery by monitoring its voltage and ensure it's being charged by the solar panel. 
The programming of the data loggers can be as sophisticated or as simple as we need. The sensors themselves are more advanced and collect soil moisture, soil temperature, electric conductivity, and permittivity. All these upgrades not only make data collection easier, but should make it much more consistent. This immediately provides more opportunities for short-term research or for PhD work. In the long term, this builds on the data set we've already established to provide a baseline to measure future change, perhaps even on a global scale. So how does all this benefit NRCS? Well, first of all, the lab, soil temperature, soil moisture information are all available to us. This gives us valuable data for future projects and update work. An even bigger benefit is that this work strengthens our reputation in the scientific community. All the people I've worked with on this project have not only been appreciative of our help, but really surprised how easy it is to get our assistance. Providing this assistance seems natural for all of us because that's the core purpose of NRCS. White Mountains are a tough place to work, but it's the ruggedness that makes them so beautiful. Thank you so much for your time. I also want to express my gratitude to all the people who have assisted on this project over the years. Any questions? Thank you, Matt. Great presentation. Uh, don't have any. Oh, I think one just came in. No, that was just Christy saying get your questions in. We'll give the uh, the shy people a minute or so here to enter in some questions. As a reminder to folks, if you enter a question after we've already moved to our next presentation, we will have the answers to those questions posted on the website. Well, I'm not seeing any questions come in, Matt. I think uh, you give a very complete presentation and the folks are still. Uh, oh, I'm uh, sorry, Dave. Dave. Well, I think we a had question came in. Oh. Ah, very good. Uh, question on who is warehousing the climate data and will it be shared with the National Water and Climate Center? Uh, currently, the, the data is being uploaded to the Henry Mount Soil Climate Database and also the University of California Riverside is also housing the data. So those two places right now. Thank you. I won't be so quick to flip the switch this time. All right, we will move on to our next presentation. But before we start that, I want to remind folks that the next webinar date is October 11th. Uh, there's still time for the audience here or people that you know that you want to uh, encourage to make presentations, to make presentations at uh, the subsequent ones after the October 11th one. Uh, always looking for good uh, content to display here. Uh, to share, to show areas of collaboration, and you know, just to show off the the work that we did in some of the really uh, interesting places in this country. So we will be sending out a invitation for the October 11th uh, next one, number 18. Right now, we'll move into our next presentation, 
which is by Lori Grzynski from the Richmond, Virginia. So we're moving out to the other part of the country office talking about quantification of histo histosol blue carbon stocks along a salinity gradient. Take it away, Lori. All right, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Lori Gorzinski and I'm a soil scientist in the Richmond, Virginia office. I came on with the Soil and Plant Science Division in January, but today I will be talking about work I did as a master's student at North Carolina State University under the direction of Dr. Matt Ricker. All of the field work for this project took place during the summer months of 2020 under a cooperative agreement with the NRCS. This talk will be all about sharing some findings on blue carbon stocks among different ecosystems along a salinity gradient in the Albemarle Pamlico estuary system of North Carolina. So you may have heard the term blue carbon used before, or it may be new to you, but put simply, it is the carbon that is stored in our oceans and coastal areas, hence the name blue coming from the color of the ocean. This includes both what is stored in the above ground biomass as well as below ground in the soil. This figure here does a good job at showing some major coastal nearshore environments, including mangroves, tidal marshes, and seagrass meadows, and how they store significantly more carbon than our boreal and tropical terrestrial forests. When you look at the breakdown between soil organic carbon and the carbon that is stored in the living biomass, especially for these coastal or blue carbon ecosystems, uh, you see a majority of that carbon is stored below ground in the soil. So we know that coastal wetlands store large amounts of blue carbon and that they are very important and large drivers of change within the global carbon cycle. But although coastal wetlands are resilient systems, they are facing many threats associated with climate change and sea level rise. In the southeastern United States, including in the Albemarle Pamlico estuary system, which is where this study took place, there are clear signs of sea level rise and saltwater intrusion into freshwater rivers, and this is seen mostly by major shifts in the vegetative communities. This is an example of a freshwater forested wetland. This is up in the Roanoke River. And down here you can see one of the coastal zone pontoons that is just trying to get the crew in as far as possible um, so that we could complete a subaerial soil description, which would be further up in this forest. But as saltwater flushes into these freshwater systems, and this can either be gradually or through um, an extreme weather event, the trees will become stressed and at around two parts per thousand salinity levels, uh, they will start to die back and you'll be left with stands of dead and dying trees, which is sometimes called a ghost forest. This is a very visible sign of climate change uh, that can be seen over just the course of a few years. This is an early stage ghost forest in the Alligator River where there are many standing dead trees and some salt tolerant shrubs are still surviving in the understory. Ghost forests like this are transitional ecosystems, so they have neither the full characteristics of a marsh uh, or a fully functioning tidal forest. But eventually these trees will fall um, as the salinity um, continues to push into the system and a late stage ghost forest will look more like this. This is at the Goose Creek State Park in the Tar River. And if you look out at the shoreline, you can see these bald cypress knees, which are, which are remnants of a forested wetland and show where the shoreline used to be while this area was forested. Eventually, over more time, the system will start to look more and more like a brackish marsh and make that complete transition. It has already been estimated that 15% of unmanaged public lands in North Carolina have changed from a forest to a ghost forest, 
where the main drivers of that change were salinity levels and the proximity to the shoreline. As these freshwater forested wetlands are receiving that influx of salt water and making this transition uh, into a ghost forest and then into a marsh, we can clearly see the changes in vegetation. Uh, for this study, we wanted to see what was happening to the soils and the soil properties and um, what changes we were seeing in the soil organic carbon pools. So again, this study was done in the Albemarle Pamlico Estuary in North Carolina. This is a vast and unique system to work in with lots of various conditions, uh, various salinities, different sediment inputs, and different erosion rates depending on where you are. If you are up a tidal river, you may be receiving uh, loads of sediment and have lower salinities, whereas further out in the Pamlico Sound, um, there could be significant erosion happening. It is the second largest estuary in the United States, and it functions as a lagoonal system. The water depth is only two to three meters deep on, av on average, and because it is uh, semi-separated from the ocean by the outer banks, the area is protected uh, from large tides and the higher salinity levels. Because of the shallow depths and the orientation of the water body, winds are able to travel for long distances unobstructed over the water and are responsible for the changes in water level um, and create wind-driven tides. So for this study, we initially looked at soils mapped within 150 meters of the coastline and found that 32% of that area is currently mapped as an organic soil, both teric and typic haplosaporists. The teric haplosaporists have less than 130 centimeters of organic material and the typic have uh, 130 centimeters or greater. This area, especially the Alligator River Peninsula, is unique in that the elevation and hydrology uh, results in very deep peat deposits. And so it makes sense um, for this area to target histosols because they make up a majority of the coastal zone. And of course they have the highest carbon content and we are interested in the changes in blue carbon. So in order to capture the blue carbon differences between these ecosystems and to keep a soil survey approach, we selected 12 representative sites along a salinity gradient, again, all mapped as haplosaporists. These are shown by the green circles, yellow triangles, and red squares on the map. Our freshwater forested sites ranged in average salinity from 0.15 to 1.61 parts per thousand, and this spanned the tidal fresh and oligohaline zones, and the sites were dominated by bald cypress and swamp and water tupelo. The ghost forest ranged from 3.51 to 8.32 parts per thousand, and they were all located in the oligohaline and mesohaline zones. They had a mixture of vegetation, including Phragmites, black needle rush, and sawgrass, and many of them were concentrated up here around the Alligator River, and then we had one here um, in the Tar River. And finally, our marshes were all mesohaline marshes, ranging from 11.73 to 15.47 parts per thousand, and these were mostly dominated by black needle rush. So at each site, we started a 20 meter transect at the water's edge and recorded five measurements of peat thickness every five meters along that transect. And then we completed a full soil description and sampling at 20 meters in along that transect. So 20 meters in from the water's edge. These samples were put on ice and that day we measured initial pH and electrical conductivity. Because these were organic soils, we used the Von Post scale of humification uh, to texture these horizons, and carbon content was analyzed by soil horizon, and soil organic carbon pools were calculated using the soil organic carbon percent and the bulk density. So this is just some of the results of the peat thickness. 
we found that from the total 260 peat depth measurements that were taken along the transects, that the average peat thickness was significantly different for each ecosystem. The freshwater forested sites had very deep organics and several sites exceeded the depth of the peat probe and were well over 250 centimeters. Uh, a past survey of this area does show that these fresh forested wetlands can commonly have up to 300 centimeters of peat, uh, sometimes more up to 360. So it wasn't surprising to find that all of our sites had at least 250 that we could at least get to. The marshes on average had 171 centimeters of peat before you hit the mineral soil, and the ghost forest had the shallowest peat depths, which was on average 129 centimeters. We also took note in the field if the peat was of woody or herbaceous origin. The herbaceous peat was distinguished from woody, from woody peat uh, by a color that was more yellow and it was missing coarse pieces of wood. The woody peat was more red in color and would contain uh, fragments of wood, pieces of leaves, um, little cones, and coarse charcoal. The freshwater forested sites had 100% woody peat, which is shown in green as expected, and herbaceous peat did increase along the salinity gradient, and that is this blue bar. And that just reflects the changes in above ground vegetation in these systems. As more herbaceous vegetation becomes established in the ghost forests and then even more in the marsh, uh, it makes sense that we will have more peat from herbaceous origin. But even though the woody peat is decreasing, uh, it still makes up 49.5% of um, the total peat in the marshes. And this suggests that this was produced prior to the salinization of the system and that it has been retained and uh, not lost as the ecosystems made that transition. The carbon pool from each component was averaged for each ecosystem and compared using an ANOVA and Tukey HSD test. Uh, this chart shows the soil organic carbon pool for each component. Um, here on the Y axis. The herbaceous carbon pool is shown in blue, woody in green, and now we also added the mineral in gray. The carbon pool from the woody horizons in the freshwater forested sites was significantly higher than all of the other carbon pools, and you can see that um, this essentially made up the entire carbon pool for the fresh forested sites, um, with the exception of a mineral layer, a mineral silty layer that had washed in over the organics in the Roanoke River. The other pools were not significantly different from each other, uh, but again, as expected, the woody soil organic carbon pool decreased along the salinity gradient, which reflects the changes in the above ground carbon production as these systems move from woody to predominantly herbaceous. Although there was a decrease in the woody soil organic carbon pool along the salinity gradient, the marsh soil organic carbon stocks um, between the herbaceous woody and mineral pools were not significantly different. This suggests again that the woody material is buried and preserved uh, within the marshes and still significantly contributes to the total soil organic carbon stock. If this graph here looks familiar, it is because Ruben Wilson, who is a soil scientist for the Special Projects Office, presented it at the 13th webinar. Ruben was the research technician at the time for this project and was very instrumental in getting all of this field work done. And his current master's work plays off of this as well, where he uses the subaerial carbon pools and extends the transect from the subaerial points to include nearshore and offshore subaqueous cores and determine loss of carbon in these systems. So moving away from the carbon pools of individual components, we will look at the larger picture of total soil organic carbon pools along a salinity gradient. The average water salinity is on the x-axis and the soil organic carbon pool is on the y-axis for 100 centimeters in graph A and 200 centimeters in graph B. 
Each circle represents a pet on that we sampled, color coded in green for fresh, orange for ghost forest, and blue for marsh. The black circles are non tidal floodplain histosols collected by Ricker and Lockerbie in 2015. When we look at the carbon pools calculated to 100 centimeters along the gradient, it appears that there is a slight decrease in carbon with increasing salinity. However, when we calculate carbon pools to 200 centimeters and look at graph B, the data shows an initial loss of carbon where ecosystems make that first transition from a forested state to a ghost forest, followed by a gradual increase at the higher salinities as ghost forest transition into a marsh. So two different stories are being told as coastal ecosystems undergo salinization, depending on how deep the carbon pools are calculated to. Only going to 100 centimeters suggests a net loss in carbon, but 200 centimeters provides us with the insight that the soil organic carbon stocks are actually lowest in the transitional ghost forest and that some recovery is still possible. When the carbon pool is calculated to 100 centimeters, excuse me, and because we are looking at histosols, most of the horizons we sampled were carbon rich organic material. But when you get past 100 centimeters, we capture how the difference between depths of organic material by ecosystem. So going back to the peat depth, the ghost forest had the shallowest peat depths and subsequently the lowest soil organic carbon pools. For that reason, as herbaceous vegetation becomes established and the marsh is able to mature and accrete vertically, we see deeper peat depths and therefore higher soil organic carbon pools than the ghost forest. Carbon in these ecosystems uh, have been accounted for in many different ways across disciplines, but we believe this is the most accurate way by using a consistent, consistent deep sampling methods to 200 centimeters and also sampling on a fixed soil type. In this case, was we did histosols. I'd like to acknowledge once again Ruben Wilson from the Special Projects Office as well as Dr. Matt Ricker from NC State, as well as the Coastal Zone Soil Survey as a whole for the opportunity to be a part of this work. Thank you for your time today, and I'll be uh, happy to take any questions. Thank you, Lori. Great presentation. While we're waiting for folks to enter in their questions, I will remind folks again that the uh, next webinar is going to be October 11th. I'll also remind folks to contact your regional field notes representatives to volunteer your own presentations. Uh, this is a great way for us to communicate with each other. Um, I also mentioned that uh, presenters between, let's see, January and August uh, all got uh, small cash awards too. So I don't know if we'll be able to continue that, but uh, we will certainly try and uh, give a little extra incentive for folks that are, are presenting. So one question did come in, Lori, if you define what is ghost forest. Yeah, sure. Um, so if you, um, looking back at those photos, a ghost forest is just, um, a transitional ecosystem between a freshwater forested wetland and a marsh. So as the freshwater forested wetland um, experiences um, an influx in salinity, a lot of those trees will start to die back at around two parts per thousand. <coughs> Excuse me, at around two parts per thousand salinity levels. And then you're just left with an ecosystem where a lot of the vegetation is struggling. Um, they can be at different stages. You can have an early stage ghost forest um, or a late stage ghost forest that looks more like a marsh. So it's just a name for the transitional um, system between a healthy freshwater forested wetland and a healthy marsh. Thank you. And another question came in. 
how long does it does the transition between freshwater forests and mature tidal marshes take? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I think it does depend a little bit on the specific sites and different um, storm events for over the years. Um, but I do know from a a healthy um, freshwater forested wetland, you can start to see changes in um, under a decade of like people who live in the area will notice that a once healthy freshwater forested wetland will start to look um, very much like a ghost forest in under 10 years. Um, and then to go from the ghost forest to the marsh, I think will take a little bit longer. And that's just on lots of different factors. Um, if it's further out in the sound and experiences higher salinity levels, it'll probably be much faster than if it was uh, more protected in one of the rivers. Okay, thank you. Um, another question came in, which is blue carbon. So maybe uh, elaborate a little bit on what blue carbon is. Yeah, sure. Um, blue carbon is um, when you think of defining soil carbon, the soil organic carbon, it's essentially the same, except we put that little buzzword on there, blue carbon, um, to refer to coastal um, and near shore environments. So just because of climate change and sea level rise, um, the term blue carbon sort of encompasses all um, work that has to do with carbon stocks um, on the coast. Hey, great answers and we've got one more question and that's uh, how were woody and herbaceous soil organic matter separated out? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Um, the woody and herbaceous, um, we could separate out that out directly in the field um, just by using um, the Munsell color and the hue of it. The woody was much more red <laughs> and was getting its color from um, the cypress and ha would have, you know, small pine cones and large fragments of wood in it. And the herbaceous had a more yellow color. And in the herbaceous, we would not find any um, fragments of wood or any pine cones or anything like that. Okay, thank you. And did I miss one there? Oh, OK, I, I, I did miss a question. Thank you, Christy. Uh, in the areas mapped as histosols, how often were they correctly mapped? Do you think updated mapping is needed in these areas? The um, areas mapped as histosols, they were all correctly mapped um, as histosols. So we didn't show up to an area thinking organics and we didn't you know we were never surprised by a mineral soil um so that was good <laughs> um but we did find so all of these soils were mapped as teric or typic haplosaporists but um using the keys to soil taxonomy we did find that some of our you know, descriptions matched um they were hemic haplosaporists or um, haplohemists so they did have more hemic material than originally thought. Um, so updated mapping um, could be used in this area. And then that could also be used to make blue carbon maps for the area. OK, hey, thank you. And our last question will be, what's the name of the soil sampling tool that's in the current photo? Oh, yes, um, this is a Macaulay auger. And this was um, really the only tool, um, this and a peat probe uh, for the subaerial soils that we would bring out there. Um, we'd carry a short one and then a long one with an extension to get to 200 centimeters. So if somebody wanted to see another uh, a Macaulay auger that was not uh, full of sample, they could just Google it or something and it's, they'd be able oh, to yeah. see that then? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Okay, whoever makes Macaulay order, uh, 
uh, augurs uh, will owe me royalties then. <laughs> All right, Lori, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, thanks to Matt too. And that will conclude our 17th Field Notes webinar. Have a good day, folks.